Good morning. I'm uh, Matt Coley. I'm a cotton producer and Jenner from Vina, Georgia, and uh, also a member of the uh, Cotton Commission. Uh, I've got the opportunity today to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Gary Adams. Uh, Dr. Adams is the Vice President of Economic Policy and Analysis for the National Cotton Council in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Gary joined the council in 2002 as the Vice President of Economic and Policy Analysis and his responsibilities include uh, the economic outlook for global cotton markets as well as analyzing the impacts of farm and trade policies as they relate to the U.S. cotton industry. Uh, Gary also represented the cotton industry on USDA's Advisory Committee on Trade from 2005 to 2011 and the NAS Advisory Committee on Agricultural St Statistics from 2003 to 2009. Uh, prior to joining the council, uh, Gary spent 13 years with the Food and Agricultural Policy Research in Institute, known as FAPRI, at the University of Missouri. And before that, he uh, obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees in applied mathematics from the University of Alabama and a doctorate in agriculture economics from the University of Missouri. And Gary and his wife, Carol, uh, have four children. And I can tell you from my experience working in Washington, there's not many better in the industry with a grasp of knowledge on trade and foreign policy as uh, Gary. So please join me in, uh, in recognizing Gary Adams as he gives us a talk on farm bill and trade policy. Well, good morning, and uh, push that out of the way there. Maybe that was giving some feedback. Thank you, Matt, for that introduction, and thank you to the Georgia Cotton Commission for for the chance to be with you and provide an update on the Farm Bill, as well as some of the trade policy issues that we are dealing with from a cotton industry perspective. And I'm getting, I'm hearing some feedback. I don't know how it sounds out there. If I need to speak up or if you can't hear me, please just let me know. Uh, and I want to thank the George Cotton Commission as well for their support to the National Cotton Council. I mean, it's, it's the efforts of you folks that allow us to, to be the voice of the industry in Washington. Uh, and there's several of you in the audience that have served leadership positions within the National Cotton Council. And we, we appreciate not only the financial support, but the support you give through your time and leadership. Uh, and you've always been there when we've needed you to, to step up and, and make sure that uh, Cotton's voice is heard, uh, particularly as we've gone through this Farm Bill process over the last uh, three and a half years. And it has been a difficult process, uh, a difficult one given the landscape that we have been trying to navigate through as the cotton industry and dealing with the pressures that are out there to hopefully continue to maintain a viable safety net for the industry from a policy perspective. So before jumping into some of the details to, uh, in terms of where we stand on a farm bill, and certainly had hoped that we'd be in a position to actually uh, to see a, a conference report or a farm bill by the time that we, this meeting came about, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, this, it's the Groundhog Day all over again in some respects in that uh, conference is continuing to proceed. It's been ongoing since really formally since October 30th, although staff work started back in August, uh, but still some difficult issues that they've been trying to resolve between the versions that came out of the House and Senate back in 2013. There were some differences in the structure of basic uh, program commodities or commodity programs, which we refer to as Title I programs. There continue to be challenges in resolving differences on payment limits, uh, income means test, and what it, uh, what it constitutes being an actively engaged and being eligible for farm programs. Any of you that have watched the press over the last two or three weeks in particular know that dairy has and continues to be a contentious issue. It, uh, it seems by some reports that it's closer to a settlement, but I don't think anything is yet a done deal. And then of course there were significant differences in terms of the cuts that would be applied to nutrition programs out of the new farm bill. Uh, and that number had to be resolved as well. So we talk about all those challenges and can say that perhaps uh, an end is in sight in the process. Uh, the latest information would suggest that a conference report uh, could come out perhaps by the first part this weekend or the first part of next week. And that would give us our first uh, full look at the package that would go to the House and Senate for a vote. House could conceivably take up the Farm Bill for a vote in the early part of next week. 
Uh, one of the challenges, though, is that there is a Republican conference scheduled for the 29th through the 31st, so it really only gives them the first half of the week uh, to address it and to do a vote on it. And then the Senate would obviously follow thereafter and then, uh, and then move to the President for his signature. So hopefully this will continue to play out over the next week or two, if not occurring all of next week, then uh, maybe by that first full week of February, uh, we can see Congress move forward and, and finish that work. Uh, a couple of things that need to be considered when we look at the timeline that may be in front of us over the next uh, two to three weeks and some of the pressures that Congress is facing to try to finalize this is, you know, technically right now with, uh, without having a new farm bill in place, uh, we've reverted back to permanent law on dairy. Uh, that hasn't really been implemented to any extent, but that permanent law for dairy would lead to much higher support prices and eventually much higher prices of milk in the grocery store if it was allowed to move forward. So that's a consideration to keep in mind. And then the other is from a budget perspective, uh, Congress has to have each, all of these program changes scored by the Congressional Budget Office. And usually the beginning of a new year or early in the new year will start a new budget cycle. So there's again some efforts to try to move this farm bill to completion. If it goes too late into February, there's a new baseline by Congressional Budget Office that would be released and you could potentially be looking at a rescore uh, which could change things dramatically. So again, pressures to try to move this forward and wrap this up over the next couple of weeks and hopefully we can see that occur. And we all know, again, just to put the background uh, out there for you in terms of the process that we've been going through, not only the cotton industry but agriculture as a whole, uh, saw a lot of pressures for change as we went into this Farm Bill debate. Uh, we knew budget pressures were going to be there even going back to when this uh, started to go into high gear in 2011 with the Budget Control Act that effectively we would probably be looking at roughly a 30% reduction in the amount of money that could be used for commodity programs. Uh, we also knew that when you look at the political landscape, there was very little support for continuing direct payments. Although those were being viewed as the most friendly from a trade perspective, uh, they did not have uh, really much political support in, in Washington. So again, there was pressure to try to change the structure of, of programs from that uh, perspective. And then, you know, the one constraint or the one additional challenge that was specific to cotton, uh, one that we are certainly, you're tired of hearing about and I'm tired of talking about for the last 10 plus years, but it's still one that's been with us. And that has been the challenge that was launched by Brazil within the WTO brought on uh, to essentially all aspects of the cotton program. Uh, they were ultimately successful with that challenge back in 2009. Uh, there was a framework agreement that was put in place between the U.S. and Brazilian governments in June of 2010 that was designed to avoid Brazil uh, launching trade retaliation with the understanding that the dispute would eventually be resolved as part of the new Farm Bill, that cotton policy changes would occur that would resolve uh, the, uh, uh, the disagreement or the dispute. And that's been one of the constraints or one of the considerations that this industry has had to deal with as we've gone through the debate. And, and just a, wor a word more about the dispute and the findings, it really, as you look at the, the findings of that WTO panel, it squarely put in the crosshairs, uh, the target price, the marketing loan, and then the, the former provision of the uh, marketing loan called the Step 2 provision, which if any of you still remember that, that was actually a provision that was ended in 2006 because of the challenge. Uh, what was left relatively unscathed from the challenge were insurance programs and direct payments in terms of the level of trade distortion that was deemed by the panel. And that really led this industry to consider what is in the new Farm Bill uh, as, a, as a safety net for cotton, and that is, uh, it is in, in the versions that were approved by both the House and Senate, so we anticipate it will be in the version once it is approved over the next couple of weeks, and that is for cotton, what we refer to as a stacked income protection plan. And it stacks is, is the short uh, moniker for that new revenue insurance product. And really the rationale being that as we looked at what type of safety net, where could the enhancements be made in a safety net that would be trade compliant, that would still provide uh, benefit to cotton producers, was to essentially look within the world of insurance and look at the way that producers were buying insurance today. And most cotton acres have insurance, roughly 82%, 83% of cotton acres do buy-up coverage today. 
at some level that is generally between 60 and 75 percent coverage. It's typically too prohibitive uh, from a cost perspective to try to go above that level. Uh, but there, so the effort was, well, what can be done with another product that would in theory stack, upon, stack on top of your existing coverage to cover a range from, in the way it's currently structured in the Farm Bill, uh, from 70% up to 90%. Or to think about it another way, there is some deductible, but it's a 10% deductible, and at that point, uh, if there is a 10% loss in, in revenue, then you could, would see indemnities triggered under this stacked uh, plan. And that is what's in the Farm Bill for Upland Cotton, or at least one of the features that's in Upland Cotton, in place of the traditional target price and direct payment that we've had in the past. Just a few other notes about stacks as it's structured in the bill now, and a couple of things to make you aware of. It is an area-wide insurance product. Most of you are familiar with, with insurance products that are based on your own yield experience. Stacks is going to look at, a, a, in most cases, a county-level experience for yield. But it is a revenue product, which means it is yield times price. So it looks at the beginning futures market price. It looks at the harvest time futures market price. That's going to factor into the revenue calculation. So it could be a uh, indemnities could be triggered, whether it's a low yield, a lower price, or a combination of the two, whichever one causes income to fall. It carries a premium subsidy of 80%. And if you know in terms of crop insurance products when they are structured, total premiums charged should be essentially equal to total expected indemnities over a multi-year period. In other words, run in an actuarially sound manner. The government pays a portion of the premiums on all insurance products, the producer pays a portion. 80% is currently the highest level of premium subsidy that's, that's available if a producer does enterprise unit coverage. This would also, stacks would also carry an 80% premium subsidy. I've already talked about the, the maximum coverage that's uh, in the uh, Stacks product. It's uh, basically a 20% band of projected revenue. It's, it's capturing that top level of risk, if you will, with a 10% deductible. But that band is flexible for the producer. It could be adjusted in 5% increments, much like your own individual coverage. Uh, so it could be up to 20% or it could be a more narrow band. A couple of other things, uh, features that are in the, in the bill. Uh, and can't really go into a tremendous amount of detail, but uh, there's a couple of things that can enhance the coverage. One is called a protection factor, which if you're familiar with uh, previous area-wide products offered by RMA, such as the GRIP, you know there was a protection factor there as well that can allow producers to scale up or scale down the indemnity, essentially allowing that, uh, that indemnity level to go up by as much as 20% if a producer purchases the protection factor up to, 20, up to 120%. It also has the harvest price option in it as you have in current revenue products. So if the harvest price moves higher than the initial or projected price, then your coverage level will adjust upward as well. And, in, and the expected yield at the county level will be the higher of a long-term trend or the five-year Olympic average. I think that gives us some flexibility if we've had a situation where, for example, new varieties have led to a recent increase in yields. Those are more effectively or more quickly captured in a five-year average than they would be in a, a, in a longer-term trend. And then finally, the other thing to keep in mind would be the, the, the fact that this will be available by practice where data are available. It will be offered on irrigated as well as a non-irrigated policy. Uh, so I know that's a, a, a lot to try to digest, but again, those are just some of the basic things that are in the bill right now in terms of defining uh, how the stacks policy would be structured. Now I do want to say just one other thing, and, and I hopefully try to use this chart to illustrate uh, something about stacks that wasn't uh, explicitly listed in that previous chart. And that is the fact that in terms of the decision, that decision to purchase stacks, it's a product that's offered by crop insurance agents just as you have with the products that you purchase now. We call it stacked because in theory, it's there to be stacked on top of a, an individual's underlying coverage. So hopefully there's insurance co coverage from zero up to 90%. It's not required to have that underlying coverage. We know some producers only have cat coverage. Some producers do not have individual coverage all the way up to 70% for cost reasons. Uh, so that's why I say it can be purchased as a standalone product or it can be purchased in conjunction with another product. 
And, and just be aware that as you look at the support level of your underlying coverage, realize there's a, there's a range for which you have coverage and a range for which you may not have coverage depending on your own individual uh, crop insurance purchase decisions. If we look at the data for Georgia, uh, at least over the last couple of years, the encouraging thing is that uh, most cotton acres in Georgia do buy uh, crop insurance. Uh, they're much more heavily weighted toward, toward revenue insurance as opposed to yield protection. And the dominant category of coverage is roughly 70%. Uh, so in that sense, it's gonna line up very well with a Stacks product. Some producers are currently buying in excess of 70% coverage, as high as 75 or 80%. And there is a decision that has to be made at that point. Does a per individual producer continue to buy that high level of individual coverage and put a slightly smaller stacks on top? Or does a producer look at the numbers and decide, well, would I want to lower that individual coverage and perhaps look at a slightly wider stacks band? So there's some trade-offs that occur. Uh, I will say in general, when you look across the scope of what's being considered in the new farm bill, things are probably getting more complicated as opposed to simpler in terms of the decisions that will face producers. There will be a lot of, of, a lot of things to digest when we look at this. So that's a brief word on stacks. I want to move along and we can certainly come back and hopefully have a chance to answer, uh, answer some questions, but I want to lay out a few other things that are, that are included uh, in the farm bill as well on cotton. Uh, the marketing loan is continued, but be aware that there is a formula in the, that is in place in the determination of the marketing loan level. And again, when we, when we talk about this formula, it is a reflection of, again, trying to address the findings of the Brazil case that had a target on the marketing loan. It would be set at the average of the, or the two-year average of the adjusted world price. And if we were considering this, for example, for the 2015 crop, it is set to be announced by October 1 of the fall prior to harvest, so announced October 1 of 2014, and it would use the two most recently completed years of data, which would be the 12 and 13 marketing years as an average. But it's going to be uh, bound by a certain range. It can go no higher than 52 cents, which is the fixed level that was in the 2008 Farm Bill, and it can go no lower than either 45 cents in the Senate bill or 47 cents in the House bill. So there's a discrepancy there that has to be resolved uh, as part of the conference process. If the two-year average AWP falls somewhere between 45 and 52 or 47 and 52 in the case of the House, then the, the loan rate would be set at that level between that. Based off the recent prices that we've had for an adjusted world price, uh, assuming this farm bill is completed and put in place for the 2014 crop, it will be a 52 cent loan rate for, uh, for 2014. And given the numbers that are already in play for the 12 and 13 marketing years, which would be the numbers used to determine 15, it would be a 52 cent loan rate for the 2015 uh, crop as well. Storage credits are continued in the farm bill with some adjustments in the amount of the storage credit provided. Uh, the marketing loan rate will continue to have the option to be repaid at the adjusted world price. Uh, no changes in the premium and discount schedules and the determination of those as they relate to the, uh, uh, to the uh, marketing loan. Uh, the Economic Adjustment Assistment, Assistance Program, which was a new program in the 2008 Farm Bill to provide uh, assistance to the U.S. textile industry, that is continued. Uh, in the new farm bill at a rate of three cents per pound. If you recall, that initially started at four cents per pound in the, in the 2008 farm bill, dropped to three cents per pound in, uh, I believe it was 2012, and, and it stays at that level in the new farm bill. And that program has been a success in terms of allowing the U.S. textile industry to uh, invest in infrastructure improvements. Uh, and we've seen an uh, uptick a little bit, at least, in the amount of cotton consumed by the U.S. textile industry. And I'll say, too, if you look back over the, go back through the press reports over the past year, this is the first time in probably more than a decade when you can actually go through press and find five or six stories about new investments coming into the U.S. in terms of textile and yarn production. But we've got them with, with U.S.-based companies. We've got companies that are owned by, in, with Indian and Chinese ownership as well as Mexican ownership that's looking at building plants and announced their intention to build plants in Georgia, the Carolinas, and Louisiana. So we are seeing new investment come into the U.S. and that'll be a, a, 
you know, a little bit of a growth base for the demand for U.S. cotton. Uh, one thing to point out, though, in, in reverting back to stacks as a final point, it, since it is an insurance product uh, that delivered through RMA, they have certainly deadlines that they have to deal with, and given the late date of when this farm bill is being passed, stacks will not be implemented until the 2015 crop. Not available for 2014. Uh, basically the same insurance options that you had last year will be the options that will be in play for 2014. So what's the program for 2014 in addition to the marketing loan? As we understand it, and if you recall, the House version of the Farm Bill included a transition program that were transitions payments paid on current cotton base acres. Uh, so it's our understanding that as we look at 2014, there will be a transition program for 2014 that will again be a, a, a type of payment that will be made essentially on the upland cotton base acres as they existed under the 2008 Farm Bill. So that, in addition to the marketing loan, will be the program that's in place for 2014 at, for, for cotton. And again, still waiting on in terms of how the details play out there, but that's the general structure as we understand it at this point is in terms of what's being considered. And that's similar to what was, what was included in the House version of the Farm Bill. A few other things to keep in mind, and, and this is certainly going to be a, a lengthy process of educating growers over these next several months of the new options that are in the Farm Bill, not just stacks, but there's a number of other changes to insurance products that are worth investigating. Uh, there's a new feature that's not only available to cotton but also other crops called the supplemental coverage option. It may not have full availability in all areas but it will have some availability uh, but that's going to be a product that's available if a producer chooses not to purchase stacks. There are enhancements in the new farm bill that should allow producers to do enterprise units by practice. Irrigated and non-irrigated could be uh, could be insured separately at different coverage levels. So we think there are some positives when you talk about what might be available for uh, improving the crop insurance coverage that's available going forward. Again though, these are not 2014 offerings, these, these at best will be 2015 and beyond. Uh, given our limited amount of time, I will make just a couple of options. I know all of the, essentially all of the growers here are not just cotton farmers, you're multi-crop uh, diversified operations. Uh, and when we look across the programs in Title I, there's going to be a range of options there for other products, other crops as well. Uh, you know, in all cases, the previous programs of direct payments, the counter-cyclical payment as it, was as it was previously structured, and the acre program are being ended. Uh, what will be included in new legislation for other crops will be a choice between a price-based program or revenue-based program. Exact details are, I think, still being worked out and still being scored by Congressional Budget Office. We understand, though, there was a, a lengthy debate between paying on planted acres versus base acres. It's our understanding that, and based on press reports, that base acres is the direction that the new programs are headed. Uncertain, though, how that base is being determined. We know they've looked at a number of options where they're looking at how to allocate uh, base acres within a crop. Uh, we've certainly been involved in terms of how cotton base is treated under some of those new, new options and continue to push, and as we understand the options uh, that are in play, pushed for base allocations and base choices that do not penalize a producer for what crop they choose to plant. Try to treat cotton equitably as we look at those planting decisions, and to the greatest extent possible, make sure that it's market decisions that continue to drive those, those acreage decisions. We are going to look at uh, more restrictive limits and eligibility. If we go uh, look at what was in the Senate and the House, and I, I put an asterisk up when you look at the fact that Title I programs had a $50,000 limit in the Senate and the House, uh, I put an asterisk there. I believe it was in the Senate that there was a separate limit for peanuts, but not in the House. Stanley shaking his head, so that's uh, affirmation there. Uh, same would apply in terms of that separate limit on marketing loan gains, but that's a reinstatement. I want to make a point. When you look at where the House and Senate have moved in this debate, that's reinstating a, mar a limit on marketing loan gains that we've not had under the 2008 bill. So it's been a continuous battle to try to, to fight off these more restrictive limits and eligibility restrictions. The AGI test will move away from farm and non-farm, and now it will look at a unified or that total AGI. 
uh, and their differences in the numbers. Senate was at 750, the House at 950,000. There was an effort in the Senate to try to apply a means test to crop insurance. Uh, and you can see if it, was, if it exceeded 750,000, it reduced the premium subsidy by 15 percentage points. No similar provision was included in the House, and we certainly hope that's not a provision that makes it in the final uh, bill. And then one of the other big fights that has gone on, and this is, uh, has been this effort to change the definition of what constitutes being a farmer or what it considers to be actively engaged. Both the House and Senate, largely thanks to efforts uh, by Senator Grassley in the Senate, was to put a labor requirement uh, in, in the in engagement. Maybe that's my signal to uh, be quiet. Uh, <laughs> uh, point taken. Um, and, but in an effort to try to um, require there be a labor contribution in order to be eligible. That's something we have continued to fight because it's the current restriction, the current test is management and or labor. Uh, so hopefully there can be some way to try to address this, but this is a huge deal because if you look at the requirements now in the regs, when it is a labor contribution, it's a thousand hours a year. And that's just not realistic for somebody that is heavily doing management. So stay tuned on the farm bill. Hopefully we'll know more a week from today as we start, to, or a week from now as we hopefully see a, a report. I do want to quickly, if we're okay on time, just bring you up to date on a couple of trade issues. Some of you may be aware that we've gone through over the past year to year and a half a countervailing duty investigation by Peruvian government. Essentially what all that means is uh, they were alleging that the import of U.S. cotton was hurting Peruvian cotton farmers and it was their intent to, to apply a tariff on the product coming in from the United States. Uh, right now we go in duty free and that's the way we like to see it. We like to be able to export cotton without any trade restrictions to other countries. Uh, so they went through that investigation. We had the chance to go down and participate in a, two or three hearings. Fortunately at the end of the day they decided not to impose a, a duty on U.S. cotton. We believe that was a, a significant finding uh, because we were worried what precedent it might set going forward. So cotton will continue to go through and, and enter Peru without a duty. It's not a, it's not a huge market for U.S. cotton, but still, we don't want to see any trade barriers erected that would impede the, the exports of U.S. cotton. I would say on another note, at the same time they were doing an investigation of U.S. cotton, they were also doing an investigation of Chinese textile products, an anti-dumping, and they actually found against China uh, in that, uh, in that case. Cotton is still a focal point within the World Trade Organization. We just recently, back in December, had a ministerial uh, where there was not as much focus on cotton as there has been in the past, but yet there still was a, a focus to try to eventually address cotton in what is called a more specific, expeditious, and ambitious fashion. fashion. Uh, there's still an effort to try to make uh, to limit cotton support in a greater way in terms of how it's limited for other commodities. But there was also a commitment to hold dedicated discussions within the WTO about the types of support that are provided to cotton. And this looks across all the levels of support, export subsidies, market access, and domestic support. I think this is an opportunity for the U.S. industry to be more aggressive, particularly as we get a new farm bill in place that we see as a way to resolve the Brazil case. I think that's a way for the U.S. industry to be more aggressive and, and really try to apply pressure on what we know are some, are some trade distorting practices of other countries. And this will be an opportunity and a venue to try to do that through the U.S. government is shed some light on what's occurring in other countries. And you have that going on in India and you certainly have that going on in China over these last two or three years. As they have been implementing a stocks policy that has allowed them to accumulate roughly somewhere in the range of 50 million bales of cotton over the last three years. Three plus years worth of production sitting in warehouses in China. I mean, that's, that's a little bit hard to fathom. But now they are moving away from that program. And now they are looking at a, a program that is more of a target price scheme. At least that's what they're considering to, for 2014. Details have not yet been released. We've had a chance to go over and talk to them about how U.S. programs have worked in the past. Uh, and we spent some time with them back in November of last year. So we know they're, they're looking at ways to try to provide support. 
uh, and that's likely to be a target price scheme. It may be only on a pilot program basis to start with and address the western region of their country. Uh, but this is certainly a concern when we look at the level of support provided there. One, a couple of levels of concern. One, they built up those massive stocks that, uh, you know, has the potential to distort the world market. They've also kept their internal prices high, which has essentially squelched cotton demand within China. But now they're looking at a change. And the way they provide support going forward may very well change, but one of the things I think we have to be mindful of is they also have limits within the WTO in terms of the amount of support they can provide and make sure that that doesn't exceed the amount of support because, you know, when you look at this and you coming over the next two or three years, you want to think about some of the issues that can keep you up at night. You know, this is one when you look at the fact that we currently have global stocks based on the USDA balance sheet somewhere between 95 and 98 million bales of cotton. We spend about 110 million bales of cotton in a given year. And that cotton hasn't changed, the amount of cotton hasn't changed outside of China. But just look at where it's gone between 2010 when it was roughly a scant 10 million bales and now when it's uh, moving up upwards between 55 and 60 million bales. You know, that, that's the huge concern, I think, uh, just one of the concerns that we have looking out in front of us. I'm going to stop there and just say, you know, again, thank you for the support. There's certainly no shortage of challenges that we have going forward. The Farm Bill is one of them. Implementation and education is in front of us. We've got trade policy challenges that are out there that need to be addressed. I think we've got to figure out ways to continue to keep ourselves competitive in terms of getting cotton into the export channels and making sure that we are able to service our customers and get that cotton to them. We've got a huge number of regulatory issues that are out there in front of us to make sure that you know, we can minimize regulations and ensure that you have the tools you need to be as efficient and, and as productive as you can be. Uh, thank you again. I know that's a lot to throw at you. I'll be here for a little bit after this session, so I look forward to hearing your feedback or comments. Uh, and again, thank you for your support.